All right, guys, let's take a look at Early Age Fomoria. Bountiful land of Fomoria was claimed by giants who once guarded the dark and stormy ocean realm of the drowned dead. That sounds like a nation for me. I wanted to throw a shout out to that one guy, 5856. He was commenting on one of my former videos. I believe it was uh, Peren, and he was letting me know that Early Age Fomoria is super fun to play. I've played Fomoria a ton in Dominions 5. I just haven't picked them up yet in Dominion 6. So after chatting with him a little bit, I wanted to come in here and really try this out. And oh man, they do not disappoint. When you're looking at this nation, I'm not going to go too deep into any of this stuff. I'm just going to summarize. These four units are all Furbolg. Furbolg are great for one thing, and that's defense and a little slightly higher HP and strength than normal. Otherwise, their Javelinists stink like normal Javelinists do, but they're good early if you're expanding with them. Slingers are not good. Militia, I would never buy them, but the Furbolg Warrior is solid. Does a lot of damage. Feel free to jam this guy in anytime you have one of these Fomorians. The Fomorians are like, I'll, I'll call them the mini giants. These guys, if you focus on the Fomorian Warrior, they have less curses and less afflictions. So, I like having less curses and less affliction, so I prefer to get the warrior at all times. I think it's worth the extra golden resource cost over these guys suffering, because then you only have two armor pieces you can buff with legions of steel later, whereas these guys have three. And it's very important. Fomoria is very slow at building, slow at doing things. You only have a map move of 16, but the advantage is you can be fast by utilizing magic. So what we're going to do is we're going to summarize these. Furbol are quick. They're good at fitting into a square with one of these guys. You can fit one of these guys with a whole bunch of these goofballs. You get one of these, one of these, and you've still got one size space left. This guy's size nine. The only time I would recruit it is if I was in a primarily land-based game and I was trying to go in the water, I would recruit these guys. I would go in the water with the Fomorian Giants and take it over because they are solid in that way. Otherwise, I try to stick to the Nemedians, which are our elves. And what I want, what I like to do early slash mid game is I like to have a couple raiding parties of 12 to 15 Nemedian warriors with a Nemedian champion. So I have little invisible raiding parties running around. And then the rest of my armies are medium-sized armies with Fomorian Druids, usually an unmarked champion or something similar, and then a bunch of Fomorian druids scripted to slam lightning bolts on people. Nemedian Sorcerai, they're something that I like to use on people just to throw different angles at people. If I want just pure air and lightning, this is what I go with, the Fomorian druid. It's easy. It's easy enough to jump in. Once you start grabbing Fomorian kings towards the end of your first year, and you grab a lucky air and you're able to put up storm on turn one, these guys become a versatile battery of just lightning everywhere. And that's what I like to do in my early wars. Later on, you can get these guys ramped up in good death. You can get these guys in good air, but I'm also going to talk about the heroes of this nation because the heroes of this nation really, really, really break you into some serious paths. So to summarize, I want to go over the commanders really quickly. I don't like the scouts. This is hilarious to have a giant scout running around, but you know, thugging him is possible. He could be a solo raider. You put something on him like a frost brand and he'd be able to solo thug, but not very well. And I wouldn't want to focus on that. For bold champion, I never pick him up. I just use him as like a troop farrier and I pick him up in like alternate castles, never in my capital. Pomorian champion, not bad, but not a great leader. So why would you pay this for him when he's the same as the Furbolg? Unmarked champion, great leader, good leader. If you have a solid bless, he's your de facto expansion leader because he is tough enough to survive on his own and he'll bless all your troops. Also good to throw in armies if you have a bless that you want to get on people. It's nice to have this guy bless your mages so they don't have to waste a turn doing it. Furbolg druids, I really, these guys are great. If you get storm up and they're able to do summon storm power, they can drop lightning bolts on people. I don't look at them as just researchers, but I do primarily look at them as my access to site search for nature gems and earth gems. You really want to grab onto the earth guys here because if you get earth boots from your pretender and you throw it on this guy, but they become earth two and then in combat, they can cast summon earth power and become earth three. Now you've got yourself some decent earth buffing spells going on for your armies and you can't get that really any other way. If you look at your Nemedian sorceress, she doesn't have any earth. If you look at your Fomorian king, he doesn't have any earth. If you look at your Fomorian druids, he doesn't have any earth. So you really want to grab the earth ones of these, throw a pair of earth boots on them from your pretender. Hopefully you have earth on your pretender or you find a random with earth two and then start cranking up to earth three in combat. Give them a gem and now they can cast earth four spells for battlefield wide protection buffs. So again, to simplify, these guys for earth, these guys for lightning spam, these guys to lead and to thug a little bit and for elfing, Nemedian sorceress for anything glamour related or twilight related and Fomorian kings for everything else. You can super combatant these guys, you can thug these guys. They're a bit of a heavy investment for just thugging, I would almost always go with multiple items on these guys and really protect them. Once you get like a death three Fomorian King and you can throw soul vortex on them and personal flight and land in the rear, it's really hard to stop these guys. And if you are smart with your scripting and still these guys out the way that you need to, to defeat individual armies, you can really treat them like solid, super combatant chassis. They're really solid. Highly recommend trying that out. So we're going to look at our magic sites for a second. Unmarked Fomorian giant Fomorian King. This is the primary reason I don't focus on a bless. The only thing that you get is like the 
Bar Guests, which is a, I think, Conjuration 4 spell. It gives you sacred dogs, but nothing really built around. But you get one water, two air gems, and one glamour, and two death gems, and Nemedian Warrior, Nemedian Champion, Nemedian Sorceress. If you're looking at this monster elf right here, who is really good at fighting, really good at pretty much everything you need him to be good at for raiding and elfing, why would you ever waste your turns recruiting the Unmarked in your capital and the Fomorian Giant, unless you took a huge bless? And if you took a huge bless, why would you take a huge bless for something that doesn't naturally have an ability to kill people? They don't have an aura, your troops don't resist an aura. Unmarked, literally the thing that defines these sacreds is the fact that they're not crippled with afflictions. That's a terrible, terrible basis for a sacred. So I like the Fomorian Warriors. Take these guys, they hit like trucks, mix them in with some Furbolg Warriors, expand, go out and stomp people, and then you don't have to worry about your mostly weak priests blessing everybody. It's such a relief not having to worry about that. So try it out, guys. Now we're going to get into Pretender Creation. All right, guys, wanted to jump over to Pretender Creation really quickly. I named this one Shocking Revelation, the Matrona of the Healing Spring. I found the Matrona to be very beneficial because she always has hounds at the side of her, which believe it or not, this helps with us random assassinations. I, you know, just always something that's nice. It's not something I'd pick her for, but the reason I picked her was this starting site is a special site that heals troops of afflictions. This is here, even if your god has not yet appeared. So I took her imprisoned because I don't need her around because my starting site has a 10% chance to reduce or remove all afflictions. So a lot of times I can just bring troops that are injured in wars back to base, let them sit there for a couple turns, and then they're affliction free. That's a big deal on Fomoria since Fomorian troops often come with their own afflictions. So I came with Glamour 5 so that I can boost myself into high glamour and boost my glamour mages with glamour items. I came with Nature 5 because if you're not against a powerful nature nation, you could theoretically get into Mother Oak and get yourself boosted in that way. But the more important part is now you can forge those items like disease healing items and rings of regeneration to throw on your Fomorian kings, similar things. The Earth 3 is necessary for the Earth Boots and the Dwarven Hammer. If you don't have access to a Dwarven Hammer in a multiplayer game, you are going to pay for it. You're going to pay for it with something and you're not going to like the cost. So not having a Dwarven Hammer in multiplayer, I would almost say is unacceptable. So I, I legitimately just took this to get me Dwarven Hammers and the ability to forge Dwarven Boots for my lucky Furble Druids that pulled an Earth random. And then Water, I took one extra point because she starts with one Water, so I put an extra point in there because my Pretender points went down to one, so I almost got the perfect score. I went Imprisoned, I kept Magic Neutral, I felt with all of our cheap researches we really don't need much magic, and I'll be honest with you, with our ability to create the Glamour research item, the Skull Mentor research item, and the Owl Quill research item, in addition to the Humonculus later when you get some nature mages running around, you legitimately never really need this magic to be boosted up, and you're still well ahead of all of your opponents. I also took luck because I like random gems, and frankly, the heroes of this nation are so amazing, you really, really want luck in my opinion. They're that good. They break you into paths that you can't normally handle. Like, it's a big thing that you want to hang on to. Plus, they have really cool stories. When you start looking into the story of Baylor and I think his name is Bress, the son, it's very cool. They have a lot more flavor than most of the heroes. So, I took Reinvigoration because I really like to SC my Fomorian Kings, and this helps a lot, as well as Low Light Vision, because almost all of your Fomorians are running around with 50% dark vision. Now you have 100% dark vision, so you're not afraid to drop glamour spells like Twilight into darkness, and it makes it really easy for your troops to have just big numbers advantages in combats when you're dropping Twilight into the Twilight Darkness. I forget what the name of it is. Every combat, it makes it easier for your guys to see. I took Heroism because, frankly, I'm only worried about my mages. I want my mages getting precision. The problem was, in order to get precision on my Bless, I would have to take Air, and I didn't want to pay her, I think it's 60 points for a new path, since I'm already doing that for Earth. So what I did instead was I took four times heroism, so you're getting 140% EXP, which is more than double, and your mages really ramp up their precision really quickly, so you can drop lightning bolts, and eventually, if I get a mage with high enough experience, I'll switch lightning bolts over to Thunderstrike. I'm one of the old school thinkers that prefers lightning bolt over Thunderstrike, almost in all cases, just because an accurate lightning bolt is better than an inaccurate Thunderstrike, but once you get your mages to level up two or three times and their precision goes up, and then you cast, you know, Wind Guide or something similar on them, it makes it so that your Thunder Strikes are extremely accurate, and since your Fomorian King can pull an Air 4, it's really good. You can set them up to just annihilate forces with non-stop Thunderstrike Blast, and it becomes very effective, but you need some precision because your Fomorian Druids are not very accurate. Their precision, I think, is a base of 9, but if you level them up two or three times, it goes up to a base of 11, sometimes even 12, and then you can start really just picking people apart. So that's what I went with. I really didn't want to focus on anything other than leveling up my troops so they became more tanky and durable and survive longer. Low Light Vision, just in case I had darkness plays with all my glamour access and the reinvigoration to keep my mages going and to also keep my Fomorian Kings going when I kitted them out for super combating. Try it out. She'll really help you out with her healer and get you rolling and she'll give you
you all the high level paths you really, really need. So that's what I went with. All right. And as promised, wanted to talk about the national heroes for early age Fomoria. We have Macha, we'll call her, the Nemedian queen. She comes in with wicked magic paths, two air, two water, three death, two nature, and three glamour. Just a phenomenal mage to throw into pretty much anything you want. It's also nice that she's a level two priest, not very important. I honestly use her a lot for sight searching because she kind of sight searches for everything I want. She can come by turn 10. Really strong, stealthy hero that you can use to sight search and also to empower your other troops by forging items such as a thistle mace and similar items. Tuan, the last Partholonian, may not look like much, but he's a level four death mage, which can really get you into high death. All you need is a skull staff to get into five, and then you can start pumping out all of the level five death forges. And you can use Tuan aggressively because he is immortal and sacred. So if you took a bless, he benefits from it, just like most of all the heroes. But the thing that makes him great is the immortality allows you to be hyper aggressive with him. Hyper aggression on a commander is phenomenal because you can just take a couple troops. You can be hyper aggressive with him in terms of little battles, running around, defending your base, going and attacking. It's not dominion immortality. It's just pure immortality. So it's really good to do. With Bress, I'm going to call him Bress. It might be Bray. He's the son of Baylor. He is the hope of the nation, but he has high air to start with. Nothing really special here. I like him the least out of all of them. He has great water breathing, normal dark vision, normal bonuses, but he's just a really strong super combatant chassis. And that's what you can use him for. Really strong. Sets himself up well, but he doesn't start with high enough death for me to be able to throw soul vortex on him. So it's a little harder for me to envision him being anything very special. Now, Baylor. Baylor, besides having an awesome name, is a great super combatant chassis. High death, high air. This guy can cloud trapeze in and destroy entire armies. He can divine blessing in a pinch. He can do a lot of things that you need. And he has a bonus attack, the gaze of death, which stomps people that get near him with a hundred precision. And so he can run around, build him as a normal super combatant. And he has just that bonus attack. And it's really thematic and really cool. Plus he looks really wicked. So try these guys out. This is the whole reason I took level two luck. I would have taken level three luck if I could, but I would have felt like that was wasteful with my order one because I just can't give up those recruitment points. So I highly, highly recommend focusing on these heroes and Baylor himself can't come until turn 25. The other three can come on turn 10. Having a high luck really gives you a huge leg up in early wars. If one of these guys pops out in early wars, that can decide the whole war for you. All right, boys, here we go. Trying out expansion on Fomoria. Looks like we have an interesting start here. Not sure if we want to turn this guy into a profit or not. Might be worth it. Send our scout over here to sort of figure out what's going on around our base. I like to grab a Fomorian warrior along with a axeman. These guys hit pretty hard and it's nice when you balance them back and forth like this because then you get one of each in each square for my first turn depending on how much gold I have left over. I'll grab a Fomorian druid or a Nemedian sorceress because you need one of these loaded up in your first war. Preferably both but I like these guys for the lightning bolt spam. I also like to rush evocation to get some owl wills and then some alteration. After that you can go conjuration or enchantment based on what you're facing. See what happens. Wow well, good thing we checked. This is one of those provinces that will completely annihilate your army and it will screw up our expansion. Good to know. Let's put our big old boys in here. Set them on hold and attack closest. Put them up here. These guys on hold and fire. Put them out front. Our prophet in the middle. Set him on. I'm blessing himself. Might as well. And word of thorns. Go snag these guys. See what we can do. See if the heavy cav can get caught by our giants. And just more of the same for the rest of this. So you have to plan your expansions. So Fomorian druids are not good expansion leaders. But the Nemedian champions I feel are. As well as the unmarked champions if you have a good bless. So plan out what you're doing a couple turns in advance. We're going to have a couple of these, which is not enough for an expansion army. But if we do this two more turns, we should be good to go. See how our first battle went on turn two or turn three, I guess it would be. Okay, we hit the cavalry a few times and our giants took on the cavalry. Good, good catch. That was great for us. We lost one or two, three. Okay. Actually, let's get more of our cap circles so we can start recruiting a little faster in here. Not yet, need one more turn. Excellent, went sort of the same way. Couple sling chucks. Excellent, they hit their own team with their javelins. Good job, guys. We love you when you do that. Lost two there, that's excellent, but now we can recruit more because of the amount of resources we have in our base. Let's increase the size of what we're grabbing every turn. I like to do this, like overpay, just because then I know I'm not gonna accidentally miss some resources that I need. So next turn we'll have an expansion party with maybe a little too much gusto. That's okay, we're gonna go here now, try to snag our cap circle. Actually, we can hop over to grab this lion tribe, that'll be good. How'd the lion tribe do? Not good for them, but good for us. 
All right, let's see where we want to set these boys. That's a lot of hop lights. We'll see what happens on this one. He summons a air elemental. I'm going to be pissed. All right, boys, here we are in turn six. See how everything went. Wow, that did not go well, but we ended up beating the hop lights anyway. Go team. How did we pull this off? No idea how he pulled this off. Unfortunately, being surrounded by bad provinces loaded with troops with 17 protection, for example, will often cripple your expansion completely for the first year because we just lost basically 20 troops that we wouldn't have lost otherwise. Routing and running and a lot of problems. That was pure luck. When you lose a big army like this, there's not much you can do to catch back up because you've just lost a couple turns. We lost a couple Furbolgs that we shouldn't have lost here because of these stupid cap cloud mages summoning elementals. And you'll also get a bad province like that where it's just something you shouldn't be expected to fight. But now our prophet can rush back. Elephant riders, you see, you just get surrounded by bad luck in some cases. Can't do much about it. Just gotta find a way through it. Turn seven, I believe. Lost only one. Okay, let's see. Let's get this guy over to the heavy infantries. Forget the elephants. We're not gonna fight there ever. We could possibly be witching lights them, but I don't think it would end well. Get ourselves a Median Sorceress since we have a little bit of extra cash going. Towards the end of your first year, like turn eight, nine, you might want to start getting Fomorian Kings for your first wars. But during expansion, we'll just play around. Turn eight, I believe. Lost one. We lost five. Our warriors are cleaning up. Got a little gold. Finished up construction one. We have evocation two. Getting a little slow expansion just because we're running into a lot of these like giant ghoul provinces and cloud mage provinces and elephant provinces. But that's the thing with expansion is if you want to be aggressive, you need to take some chances and that's exactly what we're doing all right i believe it's turn nine clean clean kills even against an azure initiate all right boys here we go turn 10 barely got a victory here that was a tough one for our prophet again taking some big l's for the poor prophet the other guys are snagging stuff pretty easily that's the issue with prophetizing your initial verbal champion is they're really not great troops and when you have a bless or lack of as we do so we get that tangle vines holy three spell it turns out pretty poorly for you in general because you're not levying a lot of damage on the opponents so you're not really Really preventing them from suffering attrition. All right, boys, I think we're turn 10. Yeah, we did. All right, we lost. Let's see what happened. We're probably just overwhelmed by numbers. Heavy Cav, Light Cav, so they're going to be raining arrows on us while Heavy Cav charges us. That's not going to end well. We're going to morale route. Almost guaranteed with these numbers, we'll morale route. We'll get tied up here. We'll get thumped on by arrows, and then we'll run. Even with that Word of Thorns coming through. Miss. 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 Oh, no, he hit that one. Yeah, they're just gonna morale route. Good try. They put up, but they didn't manage. Griffin Spires, we did great. Come on, great. Unbreakable skin hero. Good for you, buddy. Turn 11, actually, so we won't be able to get anything here. All right, boys, turn 12. Even though we had a bit of a scuffed run, we got Tuan the Last Partholonian, so we can start being aggressive with his immortality, or, or him. Yeah, his immortality. Go out and start aggressively, basically immortal bombing people. We managed to get ourselves 18 provinces, which isn't great, but I didn't really plan out my expansion very well, and we have plenty of room to expand more with armies that are really just not gonna die. And and if we wanted to go to another turn, we would have probably close to 22, 21, 22. So that's pretty much how you do it, guys. Just expand, play around with it a little bit. I haven't really maximized this and gone through it and really hyper-focused on it. If Because obviously I told you guys in the beginning, your pretender design is going to dictate the way you expand. So if you go with a heavier bless, like a regen bless, you'd obviously run around with these Fomorian giants. Just remember, they have no hats, so they're going to get thumped by an arrow and you're going to regret life. The unmarked, they have all the armor you'd need to buff, but they're just not good enough at killing that you'd want a big bless on them so i don't recommend it but try to get yourselves into an early war with a good income like this solid setup even though on this expansion we faced a relatively hard set of provinces around us we were still able to sneak here and sneak there to steal enough provinces to get 18 provinces by turn two and then one two three so 21 provinces by turn 13 22 provinces by turn 13 so try it out guys it's pretty easy to expand you can also go through and expand with nemedian warriors if you'd like if you'd like to expand a little more slowly, about 12 of these Nemedian warriors plus a Nemedian champion, once you have a little research to buff this guy up into a little mini thug, you can run around with small expansion armies. And the beautiful thing about that is they double as raiders. So once you've started to set up some Nemedian warriors with your Nemedian champions, you can start playing like an elf nation, which is amazing because then you're harassing people with elves and they're trying to counteract your elves with elf counters. And then what you can do is come in with your medium-sized armies with your Fomorian kings that you've started to recruit towards the end of the year. And now you can stomp 
them because anything that's anti-elf is not going to be anti-Fomorian king. So you guys should be good to go. All right, boys, I'm going to take a little different approach to expansion. I'm going to try to walk you through my thinking the entire time I'm expanding and explain what I would do in a multiplayer game as opposed to just rushing to expand. So this will be a bit more of a realistic expansion. See if I can make it more specific for your multiplayer game so you don't just rush out building a whole bunch of expansion only armies and not worrying about your first wars and stuff. So we're in a random. This is a terrible spot. Good lord. All right, well, profitize our first guy. I would almost always profitize this guy. Send my scout out to help me clear my cap circle since it's so small. Now we have Amorian Giants. So around turn nine or 10, I would expect to go in the water if there wasn't a strong water force. So what I'll do is I'll focus on some good Furbolgs here. I like these guys to reinforce our starting army. I would crank these guys in a multiplayer game early just to save the gold until I get rolling a little more. Then I'd start worrying about the Fomorian Druids. But I honestly, I wouldn't produce too many Fomorian Druids in my home base. Now in a multiplayer game, the Nemedian Warriors, as I've mentioned before, are really strong elite and they have magic weapons. I would be worried about getting rushed as Fomoria because Fomoria is not super great early. They're fairly weak against like a Hellblast or anything where someone's rushing you with early ethereal spam or something similar. So I would get a bunch of these built up for my expansion parties as opposed to Fomorian Warriors and Furbolg Warriors. If you really just want to expand Fomorian Warriors and Furbolgs, one to each square are really great, but battling with Nemedian Warriors would be much safer in my eyes. Five of those all by themselves and then one of those, so six. That's probably what I'd go with and throw them all in there to buff the HP. In terms of research, under alteration, the things that we kind of want are basically the mist form stuff, personal mist form, that similar stuff. And a lot of these blur spells help out if you really want a thug or something similar, but I don't want my mages going off script and just spamming blur on my troops. So I have to be careful and decide what I want to cast. It depends who you're against too. You don't want to be rushing charge body against a nation that has shock resist. Since we know we're not going to be taking any mages into combat early, I wouldn't rush alteration. I would probably rush evocation just to get myself going because one of the biggest things you need and you need it early is Thunderstrike spam. And to make Thunderstrike super effective, you want Storm, which is under Alteration 5. So you have to dictate whether you want to go Evocation 2, which is usually my go-to just to get myself Lightning Bolts, into Alteration to get Storm 5, and also a bunch of Blur buffs and similar things. If I was against somebody with Giants that were vulnerable to Shock, I would probably rush Evocation 4 for Thunderstrike, then switch to Storms. So that's what I'll do here, just like that. That's how I would lay it out. Now, if I get Bum Rush, I might throw in Conjuration 3 to get myself some Air Elementals, but otherwise this is what I would stick. Turn 2, see what we discovered. Heavy Infantry Militias, we don't care about those. Those are fairly easy, but that's a good place to expand. Militias and Light Cavalry is not great. Light Cavalry and Heavy Cav. Wow, okay, we've got a tough little expansion area. Throw these guys in here. We don't really care about Divine Blessing, as our Bless is just Reinvigoration, Dark Vision, and Heroism, and his Holy Spells don't really require any fatigue. So we'll send them out exactly where we explored. Send this guy here to see how many Heavy Cav there really are. We've got a Druid already researching. This is what I would start recruiting in a multiplayer game, and I would just put a bunch on there so that if I get more resources from conquering a province in my cap circle, I'd start producing more of them. Obviously, this is not an ideal start because you can't draw resources from underwater, but in a multiplayer game, I wouldn't worry too much about that. I've had worse starts and I can now get easy access to water straight from my cap. Now, if you have a strong water nation in the game, you're in trouble because frankly, you don't hold up to a strong water nation. You can go underwater if there's no other strong water nation, but I'll show you exactly what I would turn. Three, scout, discovered. There's a lot of heavy cab in there. What, 14? Is that 14? Oh yeah, 13. Not bad. Okay, that's doable as long as we you have anything random. You do. Ring of the Warrior. Oh, Super Priest. See how we did an Eagle Reach pretty well? Archers are probably the reason we lost a couple. Yep. Good. Good. Okay. That was close enough to how we wanted it to go. Fire and attack closest. That way we'll have them rushing the light cavalry who will be shooting arrows at our slingers and murdering them endlessly. See how many of these we have saved up. Six. I would say eight to 12 of these guys is pretty comfortable. So next turn, we're going to want a commander to expand. So I would go in here and depending on my gold, I would either get a champion for the really cheap leadership if I was really hurting. But right now, I feel like this guy can spam Sermon of Courage. He would probably be solid. I could get a Nemedian champion champion if I really wanted to to lead the expansion, but I like having the extra HP on the unmarked just so he doesn't get clinked by something random that comes and takes him out. And these guys will be more effective later. And if I was in a multiplayer game against somebody who was vulnerable to stealth attacks, I would most definitely do this. But as it is right now, that starts pushing me into dangerous no money territory. So I'm going to bring an unmarked champion with the ability to bless if we ever need that. Look around for rich provinces. This looks like farmland, swamp, plains, plains, plains. Turn three, out it go. Pretty good. Let's see how we handled those heavy calves. 
left. There weren't too many. I didn't know they were there. There were so few. Yeah, our giants took them. Okay. Good. Good job, warriors. Okay. Then I would start expanding out in whatever direction I want. I would want those, but I wouldn't rush them. They're in both directions. That's really unfortunate because those are hard to expand into with just basic small armies. Go here, see how well they hold up to a heavy cav charge. Should be pretty good with their defense because the heavy cav whiffs on this quite a bit. But we'll see because if they do hit hard, we'd be in trouble. Go back to our verbal druids. Let's turn four. We got to start looking for fort possibilities like this to cut off the walkway. And here, if it's got decent income, this would be another good option because it would cut off a walkway. Turn five, evocation got to level one not too much for us yet the witching lights is actually pretty effective if people have lower magic resist so something to keep in mind and it's fairly easy for most of your commanders to cast this but we're looking for that lightning bolt great completely whiffed on all the heavy calves because of the defense excellent that helps a lot keeps down attrition a ton why on earth did my commander charge forward? That was very unfortunate. What on earth is he doing here? What was that all about? And we won over here too. What was he doing? Advance and spells. Good lord. We're changing that to just spells. He charged forward like a psychopath. I mean, good on you, but my goodness. You act like you had quickness before you even charged in. Put two of these guys on guard commander just in case he gets jumped. Our basic starting profitized army. 112 income. That's solid. That's unfortunate that you can't produce something here because I would produce a commander here and immediately start because it would protect you from caves with dom six's new caves now you have to protect yourself from both directions get ourselves another unmarked so we can have another expansion party turn six i think beaten yep sure enough they did it again they always do it i don't know what it is just a route got all of our warriors killed there's something we'd want that's a little far from us but now we have expensive castles so we probably need a thousand i think yeah produce a palisade but this is an arena it gives you good income i would definitely want to protect this especially given the cave access Let's see how our army's still doing heavy infantry and heavy cav barbarians lizard warriors these are dangerous. So is this, but it doesn't look like they have too many. We'll try this out. Actually, horse tribe cavalries might be easier for us depending on our, nah, our attack skill and all our guys are beat up. They're looking like standard warriors now with all those afflictions. Turn seven. We got beaten again. Everybody died except two warriors. What happened? The gold province. We were kind of probably hoping for too much, but... Handled the heavy cavalry well enough. Just got overwhelmed by the heavy infantries. Yep. Messed up recruitment. Now we have more gold, so I'd start getting Fomorian Druids. Turn 8, took them out this time. And then that opens up the world to us quite quickly. Heavy infantry slingers, heavy infantries. You can go pretty much anywhere from here. Good lord, he's just really not doing well. That's not going to end well. Opens up some astral air, so we can start doing some crazy communions. We also want to start looking at getting into water, because we have these giants and a Fomorian king. If we can get one out by, like, turn 11 or so, close to the end of the year, I would. I'd want to expand in here now that I've seen it a little more. It's a good little defensible area. Evocation 2. We now have lightning bolt, so those druids, perfect timing. Remesia, we won, we won, we won. Doing solid here, turn 10. This would be a good place to expand so that our new commander can meet us there. Although he can only go there, so we might have to be a little more creative with how we go. Turn 10, so I would be looking at the giant palisades here. Two more months before we can start cranking out druids. So we want to get our income up. We've got the evocation at lightning bolt, so we can fight small wars early. We can handle some sacreds that come rushing in now that we have a few druids coming out. So start thinking about fighting. Now we can go here have our new commander meet here make sure they line up yep have our big boy here expand into our heavy cav i actually don't think he's going to be able to expand with these four into that at all i might chance it depending on how i was feeling this guy is pretty tough he's got good agility so we might be able to set him on bless and then hold one turn and then attack see how thuggy he gets put a second one in there and we'd be a little better off but because he hits like a truck and with his attack skill now he's going to be hitting a lot that way they'll never route all right here's our guy give him his giants lightning bolt is useful underwater Shark tribe, Brighton guards, I'm in line, put them on guard commander so they don't break, morale 16 solid, but we don't care, we want them all to stick around him and just film, Mr. Air can't get low on fatigue, but the good thing is with the blessing, he'll start reducing his fatigue, hopefully he won't die, turn 11, looks like we were beaten, but we didn't lose much, so what happened here, it's foolish to go into the water without 6 to 8 giants, something like that, maybe even 10, but it's just something I wanted to try out, there we go, looks like we had success elsewhere, we now have a, another castle, so we could start cranking out some fighting armies, a little bit more, once we 
we get the lab and temple built here, we'll start cranking out druids. Put this guy on weight because we can't afford to upgrade our, probably can. Yeah, we can afford to upgrade the giant. Send a druid over. He can do everything you need. Mr. Air needs to go attempt it again. He has an affliction now. Battle fright. Oh boy, that's going to go well. This would be turn 12. You only have 15 provinces. We had some bad luck and some bad indies and a definite bad cap circle. So we have a lot less Namidian warriors than I'd want. But I would be comfortable with this start. I would start looking for castles to build out here. Here would be a good one for Messia. And then I would say goodbye to good old Forgale because he is starting to get ridiculous. So what I would do now is rush Forgale back to base. See if he can hopefully get some of those afflictions. If he gets lucky and gets disease off from our healing spring, then that would be great. It would keep him alive so I don't have to deal with him. Otherwise, he'll just die when he gets there. I would keep expanding this. Go poking in here. I could most likely turn this guy into attack closest. Yeah, he'd be able to help. That would give us a little more meat in there and that would make it so we'll be able to take this province. And what I would start looking for is who I was up against because I want that thunder strike. But the problem is with thunder strike, I know that my druids can't cast it without a gem. I would need to throw a gem on them to cast it. And that's obviously not optimal. So what we need to rush afterwards is storm for our first major war. And once we get, we already have Mr. Air. So he's already going to be able to cast storm for us and heroic toughness. I love that. Goodness. Throw a ring of regen on him for sure. Turn him into something that I pivoted off. And then I, once I've got, so you have to think of your strategy for multiplayer fights, right? So I want to get into this water pretty much no matter what, because it doesn't look like a large enough water map for a water nation. So I would want to conquer all of this. Now I wouldn't, I would have to apparently go over the land to get here, but we're comfortable with that. We're good on land too. What I would want to do is take over this water, establish a little foothold here, and then start expanding out. The whole time I was doing that, I would certainly build a fort here. The income solid, good population, build a fort there. We'd have a fort here, we'd have a fort here, and we'd have a fort here in Remesia. That way we have defensive forts in each direction without screwing up our miniature cap circle, because it's a small cap circle to begin with. It's only three, and they're not really good income cap circles. Good lord, we really got screwed on this map. But hey, we did well considering. And then what you'd want to do is once we have this fort up, this fort up, and this fort up, one year, obviously it's based on the income. In this poor map, I'm not going to have great income. But what I'd want to do is start producing druids here, here, and here. So I always have druids researching in a direction that I can use them in a war. And I can use those druids to throw out air elementals really quickly or to hit people with lightning bolts until I can get my thunder strikes going. Then once in your cap, I would pretty much just continue producing Fomorian kings. Fomorian kings, what they're great for is they're super tough, great leadership. They ha they can do virtually anything you want to do. They're just not as good as the Nemedian sorceress as the at the glamour. So if you wanted some more glamour plays, you could recruit the sorceress. There's that's not a bad play. It only takes her one turn to pop in there. So doing something like this would be decent. My thing is I want at least a Fomorian king for each direction that I'm going to be defending myself. That's just like a rule of thumb I use. And what I'd want to do is make sure that while I don't have enchantment five for Horde of Skeletons spam from the sorceresses, because good lord are they good at that, especially if they pull another death or you give them a skull staff. Until I have the research to back up the sorceress, I don't like them nearly as much as I like the Fomorian King. I know he's expensive, but I also know that having one king going in a water, one king going this direction to defend me, one king going this way, one king going this way, it makes me very flexible and able to move. Now, kings don't have great map moves, so you really have to be careful running around with the kings because you can't move them too fast. Now, they're great at cloud trapezing. If you want to rush enchantment four and then hurry into five to get horde of skeleton spam, then you have good options there because once you're looking up enchantment, and again, it depends on who you're fighting, but once you're looking up enchantment, if you look at everything you get in here, give the giant strength is always nice, but your giants, you don't care about that as much. It's useful, but a lot of the little spells you can do to throw people off, like breath of winter, personal flight, personal flight on a Fomorian king with a weapon, a thug weapon going in an early war, going to the back of your enemy's commanders is a big problem for them. And everything you like in enchantment, lesser thunder ward for your lightning bolt spam, you've got early options like raised skeletons, then later you can get twice born for your sorcerer. So sorcerer, sorceresses. So you get twice born for them. I wouldn't twice born a Fomorian king. It's too expensive. But if you really have somebody that got lucky, hey, there you go. But once you get up to five, you have horde of skeletons here. You have weapons of sharpness, which is super important when you're going against people who have early earth buffs going on. Not as important as in Dominions 5, but it's still important. And you have from level four enchantment, cloud trapeze, which is super important for you to be able to just drop thugs on top of other thugs or attempts at super combatants. This early in the game, you won't find an SC, but against thugs that are annoying you or elfing you, cloud trapeze is a good way to drop on top of them and kill them. It gives you a lot of flexibility because otherwise you feel like a slow plodding giant nation. But with cloud trapeze enabled, if you throw your Fomorian druids with a couple stingers against a protection thug, they're going to stomp right through that 
guy. And it doesn't take much. So I highly recommend rushing up enchantment if you're fighting somebody who's taking advantage of your slow movement. But having a small base like this, this is a more realistic multiplayer start because multiplayer, you'd be bumping and you'd be having to order fight and skirmish for this stuff. In this particular game, if I had expanded down and right much better, I'd start looking around for money provinces such as Summerlands that I want to fight for. I would look for Mins and Satala because I know somebody's going to get those. And if it's not me, then I have to worry about who gets them and what they cost. The big advantage I found on this map was Zaburia. If you look, I have Crystal Sorceresses here. I also have Crystal Sorceresses here, and they're both close enough for me to defend. So I would start levying, since we like air anyway, levying a bunch of Crystal Sorcerai into communions to get really high air, and not even that, just air spam. If you can set up a really good communion with these girls, you can produce some disgusting lightning spam, and that's how I would pivot in this particular game. Sometime in there, I would get Conjuration 3, so I could drop air elementals, lessers, just here and there. It's something useful to do if you just have gems, because one of the ancient rules of multiplayer is use your gems. If you don't, somebody else will, and they'll beat you because of it. Now, if I remember correctly, in Dom 5, Wailing Winds was Death Air, and it was level 6 evocation, but they moved it down to level 7 with Glamour, so now only your Fomorian Kings can't cast this. Your Sorceresses are going to be the ones that have to. Now, one thing I do like to get with my Fomorian Kings is level 7 evocation, since we're already so high up it with level 4 for Thunderstrike. There's not much more that I like to rush. Wrathful Skies is fun if you cast, you know, Thunder Ward or something similar. Thunderstorm is a great outside of combat spell that you can drop on people, especially giant nations. This will cause a lot of issues. But so a trick I used to use with Fomorian Kings before they raised the cost of Twiceborn sometime in Dom 5 was I would have them Twiceborn themselves and then run into battle against a huge army. I would bait an army and then I would run in, cast Wind of Death with each of my two kings and then have them cast Soul Vortex and fight. And they would do some damage, but the key would be that I would decay everybody and weaken the whole army. And then when they died, they would be twice born back in my cap. The issue is now twice born costs way too much. So you're essentially having one Fomorian King step into a fight, cast Wind of Death, and then hopefully escape. It's not as good of a trade-off anymore. So this is much less of a rush for me. That being said, it's still something you could consider. One other thing, once you get up enchantment that you can do is I know the typical elf maneuver is to grab a couple of these Nemedian warriors, grab a Nemedian champion, and go slipping around elfing provinces. That's one way you can do it, but you can also grab a Nemedian sorceress, because it only takes one turn to recruit them, and give them a Nemedian warrior, two or three of them, as a bodyguard, and then have your Nemedian sorceress, depending on what you're going against, spam air elementals or horde of skeletons. I prefer horde of skeletons. It's a little easier, and she tends to get into that more, but if you wanted to lead the battle with an air elemental, it could potentially trample you to victory raiding six province defense provinces and make it quite easy for you. Another thing you want to consider is since we've already rushed up evocation pretty high, at least in the way that I play, once you get to level five, you have a spell here for one gem, Illusory Army. This is a new one with the new Glamour split off that produces you 20 ethereal warriors. They inflict false damage and since you almost always have a Glamour Mage on there, it doesn't matter. You can have a bunch of Nemedian Sorcerer running into combat and spamming this and oh boy, does it overwhelm people. I'll try to show you guys an example of that in a bit. Another one I would consider if I was getting myself later into the game. Summon Morrigan, these are really powerful units, but since I don't do a huge less, their sacred status doesn't really matter as much to me. They're just good units to begin with. So I don't prioritize spending a mage turn summoning these, but Dance of the Morrigans is a great spell to drop, especially if you get one of your heroes with death four, and you can drop this in battlefields, and that helps a ton. This is a big, big, big late game thing that you're dropping. You also, once you get to Conjuration 8, have obviously the King of Elemental Fire, the Queen of Elemental Air, Queen of Elemental Water, King of Elemental Earth. You have all the, uh, what are they called? Elemental Royalty or whatever people call them. That's pretty solid. That helps a lot if you can get into those paths, but a lot of times it requires a pretender focused around it or a heck of a lot more investment than I'd want to put. But Conjuration 8 also gives you, I'm sorry, it's Conjuration 7 now. I'm sorry, it's always been Conjuration 7, but I got excited because of the Dance of the Morgans. If you have Living Clouds, you can get a bunch of mid-sized air elementals. This is often a lot easier way to spam out a whole bunch of these. You can start using that. I don't lean too much on elementals anymore. I've heard that they're weaker. They still seem fairly effective, but I do like doing it. The furthest I've seen myself need to go so far in my plays with Fomoria is Construction 5. Construction 7 has a whole bunch of enabling items that are really powerful, really strong, but I don't need the Bloodthorn. This is not a Blood Nation. I don't need the Master's Athame, because again, not a Blood Nation. The Staff of Storms is useful, but I have such good Storm access to begin with, and the speed at which my Fomorian Kings cast 
it makes it fairly easy to get it up before all of my storm powers. None of the bows are really super important to this nation. Shields of Gleaming Gold are solid, but we have access to it with Glamour now to give ourselves awe, so it doesn't feel necessary. The Skull Face is a solid addition if you want to break into high death when you get your hero. That's something you can break into high death with is a Skull Face and a Skull Staff. That'll take him from death 4 to death 6, which opens you up to pretty much anything. There are a couple new fun items like the Scorpion Crown, but I don't play with them too much. Spirit Helmet, unnecessary since your Fomorian Druids can just spam it for you. You don't have Astral, great Astral access, so you don't really want this. Armors are nice, of course, they just get better over time, but nothing really here enables anything that I can't do otherwise. Boots of Seven Mile Strides is great if you put them on your Nemedian Sorcerer Eye, because then that little lady can run all over the place to join battles, because they're, it's hard to have enough Sorceress units running around, or commanders running around, that you don't feel like you always could use more. So this is nice on your Nemedian Sorceresses, but other than that, I, I wouldn't rush this for that. It's a lot of research you're putting in. Abominable Arms are obviously useful. None of this stuff is really super necessary until you get late, late, late in the game. And I just, I've never really gone higher than Construction 5 in a game because Construction 5 has so many useful things. Skull Mentors, which you can easily produce. Dream Stones, which are, I think, one of the most efficient research items you can make. And you have the mages to use them. Cure all elixirs for your goddess if you really want to lean into the healing. Rings of Regeneration on your Fomorian Kings are always beneficial because they don't naturally have the access. These are great. I love getting these on my Fomorian Kings. It just makes them so much harder to snipe. And then you start bordering into super combatant territory. You throw a Ring of Regen, Frost Brand, a Vine Shield. This on Construction 7, Boots of Grasping Earth are also great. They do the same thing the Vine Shield does and it doubles up on it. And you put a decent armor on them. Chainmail of Displacement or which helps a ton with defense. Because I believe no matter how much you get harassed down, they still suffer a minus 5 penalty to their attack skill. So it still helps you out a little bit. Just a lot of good stuff for super combatant setup for your Fomorian King. So I hope that approach was a little better than just my straight up expansion. I wanted to show you guys a little more realistic expansion. Now granted, if you started off with this cap circle, I think it'd probably be reasonable to say, hey, can we uh, restart a little with these crappy provinces all around me? I mean, it's farmland with 65 income, but you know, it's doable. And even in a crappy start like this, we got what, 17, 16 provinces, something like that. And we had a castle going, we'll get another castle here. We have our goals, our research goals are straightforward. I hope that helps a lot more because I don't want to give you guys guides that are just good for those of you that just play AI. AI, you really don't need much help to play. The goal of these guides is to get new players comfortable with expansion so that they can start experimenting in AI games and then hop into multiplayer. I'm telling you guys, don't experiment too much with AI because you'll develop habits and methods of doing things that will punish you endlessly in multiplayer. It's so much better to hop into multiplayer and just lose over and over and over and learn every time. And most of the multiplayer players that are decent are more than happy to explain to you how they did what they did, or you can just watch the turn files over and over and save the turn file and watch it and look at what you're doing and what they're doing and how they set it up. And it's a really good way to learn. Plus it boosts the overall multiplayer scene, which has now gotten much better. Dominion 6 making it 10 times easier to set up games. So I highly, highly recommend you approach every game, even with an AI, with the mindset of a multiplayer game. And you really try to expand reasonably, plan out your research, do it based on what you're facing against, and I think you'll find a lot more fun if you do that. All right, on to our specific spell examples now.